Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Heinrich and I'm the real nuclear physicist. Today's video we'll be taking a look at how flat earthers think the globe was introduced to deceive everybody throughout history. The video we'll be looking at today is Witset Gets It's True Earth 101, History of a Globe Deception. In this, he summarizes the history of all the evidence that proves a spherical Earth, as well as numerous departments that were founded that has nothing to do with a spherical Earth, but he believes were founded to hide the fact that the Earth is flat. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Heliocentrism has never been proven. It's a religion. Of course, not a religion about some personified God. A religion is and defined as being a belief system built upon the doctrine of men without any actual verifiable evidence. It requires belief and faith, it requires belief in something that you can't directly empirically verify. And, and that's the idea that the earth is a tilted, wobbling, spinning ball flying around the sun. Contrary to popular belief, it has in no way been proven. We're gonna get into it. Well, Witsit, you say that heliocentrism has never been proven. Yet in this video, you'll show a bunch of evidence stating otherwise. And of course, the biggest proof of them all, we've been to space. Me personally, no, but humanity, we've been to space. And in fact, here are some photos that prove it. And then your definition of religion. Uh, let's look at that first of all. According to the Oxford Dictionary, religion is the belief in the existence of God or gods and the activities that are connected with the worship of them. So it's not with belief without empirical evidence or anything like that. It's the belief in God or gods and any activities connected to them. So maybe you should go and find something else that you can call heliocentrism instead of a religion. Okay, so we have uh, the globe Earth inception in 350 BC, and this is, of course, as we know it, history as we know it. Well, there you go, making your first mistake. In fact, the earliest that humans have thought of the Earth as a sphere was around 500 BC. Pythagoras proposed that the Earth is round by looking at the terminator of the Moon as it goes through its phases. And after that, around 430 BC, Anaxagoras proposed that the Earth is round by looking at the shadow that the Earth cast on the Moon during a, a lunar eclipse. And in fact, there's only one shape that will always cast a circular shadow. And that shape is in fact a sphere. Then they supposedly found the distance to the Sun in 250 BC, and you have Aristophanes right after that. And when they first supposedly found the distance to the Sun, of course, it was completely wrong compared to what they claim it is now, which is supposedly 93 million miles away, which is a joke. They'll tell you Eratosthenes proved that the Earth was a sphere. Of course, he did no such thing. <laughs> Looked at two shadows. The story is just completely ridiculous. There's no primary documentation it even happened, but it's a very convenient narrative to tell people to try to make it look like Flat Earth was disproven by Greeks so long ago. I do believe in your 250 BC reference, you are talking about Aristarchus which postulated that the sun is 10 times further away from the earth than the moon is. Um, it's not a bad estimation for around that time. I mean, if you have no idea on um, stellar distances, 10 times the distance to the moon is not a bad guess. And then 250 BC, Aristosthenes. You might think his experiment would work on a flat earth, but the angles on a flat earth would be much much shallower than they are on the spherical earth that we live on. So saying that Aristophanes experiment would work on a flat earth without actually going and trying it, that's just not a valid point. You have the first globe model hundreds of years later, all the way in 1492 is when you get the first actual physical globe model, which was just like laughable and disproportionate and deformed, but it's interesting, the narrative that we're told when you actually look at it, the first physical model of the Earth being a globe ever made was in 1492. You say that the first globe model was all messed up and out of proportion. I'm not sure if you've taken a look at the flat Earth model. I'm 
pretty sure that's not what Australia and Africa looks like. I challenge you to design a globe without the use of satellite imaging and I'm pretty sure you won't be able to do it. Then you get the Copernican model in 1543 and that's the idea that we're flying around the sun, right? That the earth is orbiting around the sun, the sun is in the center. Now, of course, they thought that the sun was in the center of the entire universe and they've since had to change that. Well, yes, they did think the sun was in the center of the universe. And in fact, if you isolate just our solar system without having to look at anything else in the universe, you might have also come to that conclusion as the sun is in fact the center of our solar system. Might not be the universe, but it's still the center of our solar system. And that's how they got to the conclusion of the center of the universe. And then we get Kepler's laws. That's the laws that explain the planetary motion in terms of kinematics. And if you're not new to this channel, you know that kinematics are just how bodies move in relation to each other. People looked at the sky, saw that there's a ratio with how these things move, and you can actually, you know, create an equation to describe that ratio, so, and it'll accurately, quote unquote, predict, although there is no prediction, they just keep doing the same thing forever. You know, based on their proximity, they move in relation to each other and move in relation to the sun. He found a set of equations. To well, just stating Kepler's laws of motion doesn't really disprove the globe or prove a flat earth. In fact, Kepler's laws of motion work for every and all planets in all solar systems throughout the entire universe. Except you don't really think that there are other planets, do you? But then again, what are they then if they're not planets? You might quote wandering stars, but that's just a word that doesn't describe what they are. And then they estimated what the size of Venus was, the distance of Venus, and then they just said, you know what, to try to make this model, we're just going to assume the Earth is the same size as Venus, exactly the same, which is really scientific. Well, using Venus to estimate the size of Earth, they weren't far off. I mean, sure, we're not the exact same size as Venus. Venus might be a bit smaller than Earth, but for th that time, way back then, having Earth and Venus the same size, once again, does not prove a flat Earth. Of them. 1666, Newtonian gravity supposedly discovered gravity. It was no discovery. He didn't discover anything or that would require he'd be the first one to ever see something fall. <laughs> but anyway, so that's where you get 666 Newtons on the Earth or 6.66, and then surrounded that to 6.67. Claiming that Newton was the first one to discover gravity isn't quite true. And also, he might not have been the first person to notice that objects fall at a constant acceleration. He might be the most famous one and the one everybody quotes, but the first observation of constant acceleration with objects that fall was about a thousand years before Newton. I'm guessing the 666 Newton or somehow you jump completely to 6,67 rounded, which also doesn't make sense. How do you go from 666 to 6,67? Just you would know, but I'm guessing you are trying to reference the universal gravitational constant, which in fact is not measured in Newton explicitly. It's Newton meter squared per kilogram squared, and also is not 6,66 rounded to 6,67. In fact, it's 6,6743 times 10 to the negative 11 power which makes it a lot smaller than 666 and in fact 6,67. So once again, you misrepresent facts to suit your narrative. So who's the deceiver now? It's the same year the Selenillion eclipse was first documented, conveniently enough, which also debunks the globe. Saying that the Selenillion eclipse debunks the globe without even having a model to show eclipses on a flat earth. Come on, who are you trying to kid? So look at this picture. 
This shows exactly how the Selenelian Eclipse works on Earth. And in fact, it can only work on a spherical Earth. Michelson Morley, 1887, ionosphere, 1901, relativity, 1905, special relativity, 05, general relativity, 1915. I'm guessing you just brush past Michelson Morley, ionosphere, and relativity because there's nothing you can say to disprove it, and there's nothing you can actually say about it to prove a flat Earth. That's why you just brush past it, because once again, you can't use it to fit your narrative. And I know you guys like to quote the Michelson-Morley experiment to prove that the Earth is stationary, but that's not what the experiment was designed to do. Once again, it was designed to detect something called the ether that once again is not there, so there was nothing to detect. NACA was founded in 1915, predecessor uh, to NASA. Well, yes, NACA was founded in 1915, um, so I'm not sure what you're trying to say there. And they were conducting aeronautical research. And aeronautical in that time were aeroplanes. There was no idea of a human leaving Earth and going into space quite just yet. And yes, when NASA was founded, NACA was disbanded, but there's no need for two organizations doing the same type of research. You have the expanding universe theory come up to try to explain why everything makes it look like we're in the center of the universe unexpectedly. 1925, around that at time is where you have Hubble looking out further into space and <laughs> discovering they have a problem. <laughs> 1931, the Big Bang Theory. Yes, the expanding universe theory might make it seem like we're in the center of the universe, but in fact, everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. That's why it's called expanding. And Edwin Hubble noticed this due to the red light shift in light coming towards the Earth. And now, looking at all other planetary bodies and all other galaxies and all other solar systems, we notice that they are moving away from us, but also moving away from each other. And that proves that we're not in the center of the universe, but the universe is expanding outwards from a point. And that point is where the Big Bang Theory comes from. Dark matter to save the model because uh, relativity's predictions were off by 99% when they looked at the galaxy clusters. Dark matter wasn't postulated to fit a narrative of a spherical Earth. Once again, an observation was made by the scientific community, calculations were made by the scientific community, and values didn't align. But as a scientific community, we go back to the drawing board. We see where we made our mistakes, we see what we can do to correct our mistakes. And Adding dark matter or postulating that there is a mass that can't be seen or interacts with light. There's, a, there's particles that doesn't interact with light. That actually proved to work and in all calculations it gave accurate predictions. And in fact, I think there's actually um, satellites in the L2 orbit of the sun doing dark matter studies. So we're actually still busy exploring that avenue of science. What avenues of science does Flat Earth explore? I mean, going to the beach, pointing your hands out and saying, look, horizon flat. That's not really science, that's just what Flat Earthers do. Now this is where it gets very interesting. You get to 1945, Operation Paperclip. You got the government bringing people over, bringing Nazis over. They put paperclips in different folders to have them integrate into the United States in different positions, right? Engineer, scientist, etc. Now I'm not American, so Operation Paperclip is not something that happened in my country. But from a scientific standpoint, it makes sense. In 1945, the Germans had quite a lot of scientists working on quite a lot of technology and having that technology in my country would only make sense so having project paperclip or operation paperclip does not seem 
in any way related to proving that the Earth is flat. I mean, that's just an intelligence operation performed by the US government during a world war, which is actually quite common during any war for governments to have operations within other governments. So then you have the very next year after bringing them over here, they go explore Antarctica Operation High Jump. And the CIA was founded the very next year. <laughs> the CIA was founded the very next year. Now we know they do stuff like Operation Mockingbird and, and, and you know, they literally propagandize the American public. And then you have the Mars Project written by Werner von Braun, one of the people brought over in Operation Paperclip, an SS officer of the Nazi regime. And in this book, the main character's title is Elon and he founds the first civilization on Mars. So just a coincidence there. Then you get to 1952. NSA was founded. Once again, I'm not American, so I can't comment too much on Operation High Jump. But from what I can gather, it's basically just the USA trying to set up research stations in Antarctica. And by the looks of it today, they did it. And yet, it doesn't prove a flat Earth. And once again, the CIA, the NSA, I'm not going to comment on them. Because, like I said, I'm not American. They are not any way relevant to proving a flat Earth. So, I'm going to skip past them. Project Mars from Werner von Braun. It's probably just coincidence that the main character's name is Elon. Or maybe Elon's mother read the novel, saw great things for her son, and named him after the main character. There's no proof that you can any way show to say that this was globe inception to disprove a flat earth or anything like that. I mean, right now, you're just grasping at straws. And then 55, Operation Deep Freeze, go back to Antarctica. They ended up founding the, the first American base there called Little America. From what I can gather, Operation Deep Freeze was just more research stations and more research conducted in Antarctica and by everything that I've read Little America was already established way back in Operation High Jump so I might be wrong I might have my facts wrong but I'm pretty sure you've got your facts wrong then you have the Dew system in 1957. That is where they started actually monitoring the north. So they go out to the south and then they come back out to the north and they put up a, it's now called like the North Warning System, but there's basically a trip line around the North Pole and they monitor anything inside of a certain latitude. Now, the only reason that they would, now what's it, the reason for this due system or early warning system is actually was another war well what's it the due system wasn't set up to monitor the north pole in fact the due system was set up as a distant early warning that's where the word due comes from for bombers that came from the soviet union because once again, this was in the middle of the Cold War and one country was trying to monitor another country so that they don't get the jump on them. So once again, nothing to do with the flat earth. Right, and then you have NASA founded in 1958, the next year. And then in 1959, they signed the Antarctic Treaty. So now they're monitoring the inside and the outside. Yes, NASA was founded in 1958. Once again, it's just another agency well, in this case, not an agency, but an administration. And why was it founded? Because people were starting to look, to look towards the stars. And we were looking for more places to explore. And then Antarctic Treaty, coming from South Africa, is one of the signatories on the treaty. It's not to keep people out, to have nobody go and sniff around or anything like that. In fact, it's to preserve Antarctica because we as humans, what do we do? We go, we invade, we destroy, and then there's nothing left. So the Antarctic Treaty is there to stop us from 
invading and destroying Antarctica. And then you have the DIA found in the 61 Operation Fishbowl, high altitude missiles, of course, that part of Dominique, which translates to of the Lord. So Operation Fishbowl of the Lord, they shot high altitude missiles up. Well, first of all, Operation Fishbowl couldn't have been used to try and blow up the firmament because the firmament doesn't exist. You can't blow up something that's not there. In fact, Operation Fishbowl was used to get data that USA desperately needed to know how deadly nuclear bombs are. So it's not to destroy your imaginary firmament, but rather to get data on how deadly bombs are. So maybe change your narrative, change your mindset, and then you will actually see that not everybody is out to lie and deceive like the flat earthers are. And we got in the 30s, we actually have documents now that are declassified that says that they had approximation methods to determine the brightness of the firmament that were proven accurate and that it has different zenith measurements, meaning that there's literally a distance, a zenith measurement to the firmament above you and that they were able to accurately map it out. As for this paper that you reference that approximate the brightness of the firmament, I couldn't really find anything of it in an accredited publication or that has been peer reviewed so if you'd like send me the link send me the paper i'd have a look look at it we can discuss it and then let's see where it takes us and then we get over to the jfk moon landing announcement 1962 67 there was a space treaty signed in 67 you have gus grissom dying after saying we can't go to the moon that it's ridiculous jfk announcing the moon landing or that they were planning to go to the moon is not out of the ordinary. In fact, that's quite something that a president of a country would be proud to announce. And given that there was a space race between USA and the USSR, I mean, having to be the first person to do it was quite an achievement. So, yes, and then a space treaty, once again, like the Antarctic Treaty, they're planning to go somewhere. They realize people show up, we destroy it. So, we need something that says what we may do in space, what we may not do in space to make sure that everybody is on the same page so that we don't go out there and destroy everything in our sight. And making reference of Gus Grissom and not astronaut White or Shafi who was with him in the command module that caught fire, that caused their untimely deaths, is disrespectful. I mean, at least by respects to everybody who lost their lives in this tragic tragic accident. The 1968-2001 Space Odyssey comes out, film of the year, basically propagandizes everyone to believe we're about to go to the moon. And also Newsbenders comes out where they, where they tell you everything about space is fake in 1968. Now picture this. Your president tells you that they will be doing an exploration to the center of the Earth. And along with everybody's excitement, a Hollywood film studio gets the idea to ride this hype train and they create a movie, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Now, given that you are in the era where everybody is planning to go to the center of the Earth and a movie comes out, Journey to the Center of the Earth, it will actually be a very big box office hit. So that's exactly what happened with 2001 The Space Odyssey. It was in the time everybody is excited to go to space. Hollywood Film Studio thinks this is a great time for us to ride this hype train and they make the film. So once again, not proving anything actually. It just proves that the people in Hollywood are quite smart on how and when they choose to make which movies. In 1969, they're supposed to go to the moon, and then they see the Earth from space, confirming the Earth is allegedly a sphere in 1972 at the tail end of the Apollo missions, and that's the really like the only claimed real picture of the Earth from space for decades. Okay, so there is the, the timeline. Well, actually the blue marble wasn't the first photo of Earth from space. In fact, the first photo from, of Earth from space happened even before we landed on the moon was during Apollo 8 where the lunar module around that was in orbit around the moon took a photo of the earth as it was rising and 
in fact famously it's captioned as earth rods thanks everyone for watching i'm heinrich i'm the real nuclear physicist and this was an experience i'm not going to say a good one or a bad one but an experience hit that like and subscribe button press the bell for, to get notifications every time i post a video and i'll see you next time